steps of Hindu philosophical thought. The first group of religious ideas that we see coming up, I mean recognized religious ideas and not the very low ideas, which do not deserve the name of religion, all include the idea of inspiration and revealed books and so forth. The first group of religious ideas starts with the idea of God. Here is the universe, and this universe is created by a certain being. Everything that is in this universe has been created by him. Along with that, at a later stage, comes the idea of soul, that there is this body, and something inside this body which is not the body. This is the most primitive idea of religion that we know. We can find a few followers of that in India, but it was given up very early. The Indian religions take a peculiar start. It is only by strict analysis and much calculation and conjecture that we can ever think that that stage existed in Indian religions. The tangible state in which we find them is the next step, not the first one. At the earliest step, the idea of creation is very peculiar, and it is that the whole universe is created out of zero, at the will of God, that all this universe did not exist, and out of this nothingness, all this has come. In the next stage, we find this conclusion is questioned. How can existence be produced out of non-existence? At the first step in the Vedanta, this question is asked. If this universe is existent, it must have come out of something, because it was very easy to see that nothing comes out of nothing anywhere. All work that is done by human hands requires materials. If a house is built, the material was existing before. If a bolt is made, the material existed before. If any implements are made, the materials were existing before, so the effect is produced. Naturally, therefore, the first idea that this world was created out of nothing was rejected, and some material out of which this world was created was wanted. The whole history of religion, in fact, is this search after that material. Out of what has all this been produced? Apart from the question of the efficient cause or God, apart from the question that God created the universe, the great question of all questions is, out of what did he create it? All the philosophies are turning, as it were, on this question. One solution is that nature, God, and soul are eternal existences, as if three lines are running parallel eternally, of which nature and soul comprise what they call the dependent, and God the independent reality. Every soul, like every particle of matter, is perfectly dependent on the will of God. Before going to the other steps, we will take up the idea of soul, and then find that with all the Vedantic philosophers, there is one tremendous departure from all Western philosophy. All of them have a common psychology. Whatever their philosophy may have been, their psychology is the same in India, the old Shankya psychology. According to this, perception occurs by the transmission of the vibrations, which first come to the external sense organs, from the external to the internal organs, from the internal organs to the mind, from the mind to the booty, from the booty or intellect, to something which is a unit, which they call the Atman. Coming to modern physiology, we know that it has found centers for all the different sensations. First it finds the lower centers, and then a higher grade of centers, and these two centers exactly correspond with the internal organs in the mind. But not one center has been found which controls all the other centers. So physiology cannot tell what unifies all these centers. Where do the centers get united? The centers in the brain are all different, and there is not one center which controls all the other centers. Therefore, as far as it goes, the Indian psychology stands unchallenged upon this point. We must have this unification, something upon which the sensations will be reflected, to form a complete whole. Until there is that something, I cannot have any idea of you, or a picture or anything else. If we had not that unifying something, we would only see, then after a while, breathe, then hear, and so on. And while I heard a man talking, I would not see him at all, because all the centers are different. This body is made of particles, which we call matter, and it is dull and insentient. So is what the Vedantists call the fine body. The fine body, according to them, is a material but transparent body made of very fine particles, so fine that no microscope can see them. What is the use of that? It is the receptacle of the fine forces. Just as this gross body is the receptacle of the gross forces, so the fine body is the receptacle of the fine forces, which we call thought in its various modifications. First is the body, which is gross matter, with gross force. Force cannot exist without matter. It must require some matter to exist, so the grosser forces work in the body, and those very forces become finer. The very force which is working in the gross form works in a fine form and becomes thought. 
There is no distinction between them. Simply one is the gross and the other the fine manifestation of the same thing. Neither is there any distinction between this fine body and the gross body. The fine body is also material, only very fine matter. And just as this gross body it is the instrument that works the gross forces, so the fine body is the instrument that works the fine forces. From where do all these forces come? According to Vedanta philosophy, these are two things in nature, one of which they call akasha, which is the substance, infinitely fine, and the other they call prana, which is the force. Whatever you see or feel or hear as air, earth, or anything is material, the product of akasha. It goes on and becomes finer and finer, or grosser and grosser, changing under the action of prana. Like akasha, prana is omnipresent and interpenetrating everything. Akasha is like the water, and everything else in the universe is like blocks of ice made out of that water and floating in the water, and prana is the power that changes this akasha into all these various forms. The gross body is the instrument made out of akasha, for the manifestation of prana in gross forms as muscular motion or walking, sitting, talking, and so forth. That fine body is also made of akasha, a very fine form of akasha, for the manifestation of the same prana in the finer form of thought. So first there is this gross body, beyond that is this fine body, and beyond that is the jiva, the real man. Just as the nails can be parred off many times and yet are still part of our body, not different, so is our gross body related to the fine. It is not that a man has a fine and also a gross body. It is the one body only. The part which endures longer is the fine body, and that which dissolves sooner is the gross. Just as I can cut this nail any number of times, so millions of times I can shed this gross body, but the fine body will remain. According to the dualists, this jiva, or the real man, is very fine, minute. So far we see that man is a being, who has first a gross body which dissolves very quickly, then a fine body which remains through eons, and then a jiva. This jiva, according to the Vedanta philosophy, is eternal, just as God is eternal. Nature is also eternal, but changefully eternal. The material of nature, prana and akasha, is eternal. But it is changing into different forms eternally. But the jiva is not manufactured either of akasha or prana. It is immaterial and therefore will remain forever. It is not the result of any combination of prana or akasha, and whatever is not the result of combination will never be destroyed, because destruction is going back to causes. The gross body is a compound of akasha and prana, and therefore will be decomposed. The fine body will also be decomposed after a long time, but the jiva is simple and will never be de destroyed. It was never born for the same reason. Nothing simple can be born. The same argument applies. That which is a compound only can be born. The whole of nature comprising millions and millions of soul is under the will of God. God is all-pervading, omniscient, formless, and he is working through day and night. The whole of it is under his control. He is the eternal ruler. So say the dualists. Then the question comes, if God is the ruler of this universe, why did he create such a wicked universe? Why must we suffer so much? They say it is not God's fault. It is our fault that we suffer. Whatever we sow, we reap. He did not do anything to punish us. Man is born poor or blind or some other way. What is the reason? He had done something before. He was born that way. The jiva has been existing for all times, was never created. It was been doing all sorts of things all the time. Whatever we do reacts upon us. If we do good, we shall have happiness, and if evil, unhappiness. So the jiva goes on enjoying and suffering and doing all sorts of things. What comes after death? All these Vedanta philosophers admit that this jiva is by its own nature pure. But ignorance covers its real nature, they say. As by evil deeds it has covered itself with ignorance, so by good deeds it becomes conscious of its own nature again. Just as it is eternal, so its nature is pure. The nature of every being is pure. When through good deeds all its sins and misdeeds have been washed away, then the jiva becomes pure again. And when it becomes pure, it goes to what it is called devayana. Its organ of speech enters the mind. You cannot think without words. Wherever there is thought, there must be words. As words enter the mind, so the mind is resolved into the prana, and the prana into the jiva. Then the jiva gets quickly out of the body and goes to the solar regions. This universe has spheres after sphere. 
This earth is the world sphere, in which are the moon, sun, and stars. Beyond that, here is a solar sphere, and beyond that, another which they call the lunar sphere. Beyond that, there is a sphere which they call the sphere of lightning, the electric sphere. And when the jiva goes there, there comes another jiva, already perfect to receive it, and takes it to another world, the highest heaven, called the Brahma Loka, where the jiva lives eternally, no more to be born or to die. It enjoys through eternity and gets all sorts of powers except the power of creation. There is only one ruler of the universe, and that is God. No one can become God. The dualists maintain that if you say you are a God, it is a blasphemy. All powers except the creative come to the jiva. If it likes to have bodies and work in different parts of the world, it can do so. If it orders all the gods to come before it, if it wants its forefathers to come, they all appear at its command. Such are its powers that it never feels any more pain, and if it wants, it can live in the Brahma Loka through all eternity. This is the highest man who has attained the love of God, who has become perfectly unselfish, perfectly purified, who has given up all desires, and who does not want to do anything except worship and love God. There are others that are not so high, who do good works but want some reward. They say they will give so much to the poor, but want to go to heaven in return. When they die, what becomes of them? The speech enters the mind, the mind enters the prana, the prana enters the jiva, and the jiva gets out and goes to the lunar sphere, where it has a very good time for a long period. There it enjoys happiness, so long as the effects of its good deeds endure. When the same is exhausted, it descends, and once again enters life on earth according to its desires. In the lunar sphere, the jiva becomes what we call a god, or what the Christians or Mohammedans call an angel. These gods are the names of certain positions, for instance, Indra, the king of gods, is the name of a position. Thousands of men get to that position. When a virtuous man who has performed the highest of Vedic rites dies, he becomes a king of the gods. By that time the old king has gone down again and became man. Just as kings change here, so the gods, the devas, also have to die. In heaven they will all die. The only deathless place is Brahmaloka where alone there is no birth or death. So the jivas go to heaven and have an overly good time except now and then when the demons give them chase. In our mythology it is said that there are demons who sometimes trouble the god. In all mythologies you read how these demons and the gods fought and the demons sometimes conquered the gods, although many times it seems that the demons did not do so many wicked things as the gods. In all mythologies, for instance, you find the devas fond of women, so after their reward is finished, they fall down again, come through the clouds, through the rains, and thus get into some grain or plant and find their way into the human body. When the grain or plant is eaten by man, the father gives them a material out of which to get a fitting body. When the material suits them no longer, they have to manufacture other bodies. Now they are the very wicked fellows who do all sorts of diabolical things. They are born again as animals, and if they are very bad, they are born as very low animals or become plants or stones. In the diva form, they make no karma at all. Only man makes karma. Karma means work which will produce effect. When a man dies and becomes a diva, he is only a period of pleasure and during that time makes no fresh karma. It is simply a reward for his past karma. When the good karma is worked out, then the remaining karma begins to take effect, and he comes dozen down to earth. He becomes man again, and if he does very good works and purifies himself, he goes to Brahmaloka and comes back no more. The animal is a state of sojourn for the jiva, evolving from lower forms. In course of time, the animal becomes man. It is a significant fact that as the human population is increasing, the animal population is decreasing. The animal souls are all becoming men. So many species of animals have become men already. Where else have they gone? In the Vedas, there is no mention of hell. But our Puranas, the later books of our scriptures, thought that no religion should be complete unless hells were attached to it. And so they invented all sorts of hells. In some of these, men are sawed in half and continually tortured but do not die. They are continually feeling intense pain. But the books are merciful enough to say it is only for a period. Bad karma is worked out in that state, and then they come back on earth and get another chance. So this human form is the great chance. It is called the karma body in which we decide our fate. We are running in a huge circle, and this is the point in the circle which determines the future. 
So this is considered the most important form that there is. Man is greater than the gods. So far with dualism, pure and simple, next comes the higher Vedantic philosophy which says that this cannot be. God is both the material and the efficient cause of this universe. If you say there is a God who is an infinite being, and a soul which is also infinite, and a nature which is also infinite, you can go on multiplying infinites without limit, which is simply absurd. You smash all logic. So God is both the material and the efficient cause of the universe. He projects this universe out of himself. Then how is it that God has become these walls and this table, that God has become the pig and the murderer, and all the evil things in the world? We say that God is pure. How can he become all these degenerate things? Our answer is, just as I am a soul and have a body, and in a sense, this body is not different from me, yet I, the real I, in fact, am not the body. For instance, I say, I am a child, a young man, or an old man, but my soul is not changed, it remains the same soul. Similarly, the whole universe, comprising all nature and an infinite number of souls, is, as it were, the infinite body of God. He is interpenetrating the whole of it. He alone is unchangeable, but nature changes and soul changes. He is unaffected by changes in nature and soul. In what way does nature change? In its forms it takes fresh forms. But the soul cannot change that way. The soul contracts and expands in knowledge. It contracts by evil deeds. Those deeds which contract the real, natural knowledge and purity of the soul are called evil deeds. These deeds again which bring out the natural glory of the soul are called good deeds. All these souls were pure, but they have become contracted through the mercy of God, and by doing good deeds, they will expand and recover their natural purity. Everyone has the same chance, and in the long run must get out, but this universe will not cease because it is eternal. This is the second theory. The first is called dualism. The second holds that there are God, soul, and nature and soul and nature form the body of God, and therefore these three form one unit. It represents a higher stage of religious development and goes by the name of qualitative monism. In dualism, the universe is conceived as a large machine set going by God, while in a qualified monism, it is conceived as an organism interpenetrated by the divine self. The last are the non-dualist. They raise the questions also that God must be both the material and the efficient cause of the universe. As such, God has become the whole of this universe, and there is no going against it. And when these other people say that God is the soul, and the universe is the body, and the body is changing, but God is changeless, the non-dualists say, all this is nonsense. In that case, what is the use of calling God the material cause of this universe? The material cause is the cause become effect. The effect is nothing but the cause in another form. Wherever you see an effect, it is the cause reproduced. If the universe is the effect and God the cause, it must be the reproduction of God. If you say that the universe is the body of God, and that the body becomes contracted and fine and becomes the cause, and out of that the universe is evolved, the non-dualists say that it is God himself who has become this universe. Now comes a very fine question. If this God has become the universe, you and all these things are God. Well, certainly. This book is God. Everything is God. My body is God and my mind is God. And my soul is God. Then why are there so many jivas? Has God become divided into millions of jivas? Does that one God turn into millions of jivas? Then how did it become so? How can the infinite power and substance, the one being of the universe, become divided? It is impossible to divine and divide infinity. How can that pure being become this universe? If he has become the universe, he is changeful. And if he is changeful, he is part of nature. And whatever is nature and changeful is born and dies. If our God is changeful, he must die some day. Take note of that. Again, how much of God has become this universe? If you say X, the unknown algebraic quantity, then God is God minus X now, and therefore not the same God as before this creation, because so much has become this universe. So the non-dualists say, this universe does not exist at all, it is all illusion. The whole of this universe, these divas, gods, angels, and all the other beings born and dying, all this infinite number of souls coming up and coming down are all dreams. There is no jiva at all. How can there be any? It is the one infinity. 
as the one sun reflected on various pieces of water appears to be many, and millions of globules of water reflect so many millions of suns, and in each globule will be a perfect image of the sun. Yet there is only one sun, so are all these jivas but reflections in different minds? These different minds are like so many different globules reflecting this one being. God is being reflected in all these different jivas, but a dream cannot be without a reality, and that reality is at one infinite existence. You as body, mind, or soul are a dream, but what you really are is existence, knowledge, bliss. You are the God of this universe. You are creating the whole universe and drawing it in, thus say the Advaitists. So all these birth and rebirth, coming and going, are the figment of Maya. You are infinite. Where can you go? The sun, the moon, and the whole universe are but drops in your transcendent nature. How can you be born or die? I never was born, never will be born. I never had father or mother, friends or foe. For I am existence, knowledge, bliss absolute. I am he, I am he. So what is the goal, according to this philosophy? That those who receive the knowledge are one with the universe. For them, all heavens and even Brahma Loka are destroyed. The whole dream vanishes and they find themselves the eternal God of the universe. They attain their real individuality with its infinite knowledge and bliss and become free. Pleasures and little things cease. We are finding pleasure in this little body, in this little individuality. How much greater the pleasure when this whole universe is my body? If there is pleasure in one body, how much more when all bodies are mine? Then is freedom attained, and this is called Advaita, the non-dualistic Vedanta philosophy. These are the three steps which Vedanta philosophy has taken, and we cannot go any further because we cannot go beyond unity. When a science reaches a unity, it cannot by any manner of means go any further. You cannot go beyond this idea of the Absolute. All people cannot take up this Advaita philosophy. It is hard. First of all, it is very hard to understand it intellectually. It requires the sharpest of intellects, a bold understanding. Secondly, it does not suit the vast majority of people. So there are these three steps. Begin with the first one. Then by thinking of that and understanding it, the second will open itself. Just as a race advances, so individuals have to advance. The steps which the human race has taken to reach to its highest pinnacles of religious thought, every individual have to take. Only while a human race took millions of years to reach from one step to another, individuals may live the whole life of a human race in a much shorter duration. But each one of us will have to go through these steps. Those of you who are non-dualist look back to the period of your lives when you were strong dualists. As soon as you think you are a body and a mind, you will have to take the whole of this dream. If you take one portion, you must take the whole. The man who said, here is this world, and there is no personal God, is a fool. Because if there is a world, there will have to be a cause, and that is what is called God. You cannot have an effect without knowing that there is a cause. God will only vanish when this world vanishes. Then you will become God absolute, and this world will be no longer for you. So long as the dream that you are a body exists, you are bound to see yourself as being born and dying. But as soon as that dream vanishes, so will the dream vanish that you are being born and dying. And so will the other dream, that there is a universe, vanish. That very thing, which we now see as the universe, will appear to us as God, absolute. And that very God, who has so long been external, will appear to be internal as our very own self.